Okay. All right, so we're live on Facebook today. So thanks for joining us. Um, the interview that we have today, um, as I reminded you yesterday, is with Dr. Richard Bradbury. Um, so Richard is a parasitologist um, and also an infectious disease researcher at Federation University in Victoria. Um, so Rich is gonna be talking to us about different parasites that we can catch from our pet dogs primarily, but also we're gonna ask a few questions about how Richard got into this area of research, how he became a scientist in the first place. Um, I'm particularly really excited about this interview because I also work at Federation University, but this is a really the first time I've actually seen Richard um, and spoken to him in person um, because of COVID, meaning that we've all had to work from home. So I'll just welcome Richard to our interview. Thanks. Um, so Richard, I'm gonna start the interview off with a question that Lisa Jones also asked me, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was a very interesting question. Um, so the question is, tell us um, about what parasitologists or what parasitologists do and why is the word parasitologist very hard to pronounce? Well, thanks. That's a great question, Sarah. And thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, what do parasitologists do? Well, we like to study worms, basically, and also protozoa, which are like those little single-celled amoeba things that you sometimes might have seen in science shows crawling along like that. So these are basically animals which live inside another animal. And the word parasitology comes from parasitos, which is Greek, and it got adopted around the 16th century, parasitos meaning beside and eating. So eating at another person's table is what it really translates to mean, parasite. Something which eats at another man's table. And this is what happens. A parasite is an animal which gets into another animal and gets derives its nutrients from that animal somehow. So when we talk about parasites in humans and, and dogs and things like this, what we're really talking about is like worms, protozoa, amoeba, that get into maybe get into our intestines or they may even get into other parts of our body and there they consume nutrients and um, they also may be prepared to be for us to be a part of their life cycle and then they'll move into another animal when for instance um, the eggs of the parasite might be passed out in our feces or something like that so yeah that's uh, that's what parasitology is it's the study of all those wonderful creepy crawly things oh great and yeah i think they're just so clever the way they're able to you know, I guess the original word being sitting at someone else's table, but able to adopt that and, you know, live off someone else. Um, They're very smart. You know, if you actually learn a little bit about how parasites transmit and how they live, it's incredible how complex some of these systems are and how intricate they've got about um, taking advantage of activities and things which we will do to continue their own life. It's really quite fascinating. It's a great, great subject. So... You know, I'm, I'm obviously have dedicated my career to it and I think it's just fantastic. It's really satisfying. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So on that question um, and answer, how did you become a parasitologist? <laughs> okay, so I, I actually liked parasites before I went to university. So when I was a teenager, I started reading books about diseases and I thought they were really cool. And, you know, two things spring to mind. One was um, I had a pet cat a tomcat who I thought was absolutely fantastic. And I lived on a farm, so this cat was always eating rabbits and things. And one day this, this cat just coughed up in front of me, this giant worm that then proceeded to ride around where the cat had coughed up. I mean, it was just, it was quite interesting, actually. It was kind of gross, but, you know, I thought it was really interesting. And it turns out that that was actually what we call Toxicara, that worm. Um, I know now, but at the time I just thought it was really, wow, this, this cat's got this giant worm that it's just coughed up from inside of it. Um, the simple answer is I, I was one of those kids at school who liked gross stuff, little boys who liked gross things, and I just never grew out of it. So it got to be my, uh, my, my profession. Um, I grew up and, and continued to enjoy gross stuff. Yeah. So what would you have studied at university? I did medical laboratory science um, in Tasmania, which I think has a different name now, my degree um, down there. But uh, what I did was I studied a course which was specific for me to go and work in diagnostic pathology labs in hospitals and private pathology labs. And I did that for about 12 years. And once I started work, I then specialised in microbiology and parasitology. And I was very lucky that working at the Royal Hobart Hospital, we did a lot of work through refugee clinics. So I was able to see a lot of really interesting parasites in 
people who were refugees at that time. Um, less common now because people are getting treated before they come to Australia, um, but at the time, often early on in, in the 2000s, they weren't. There's no public health impact from that because these things are tropical parasites that won't survive in Australia or in, in southern Australia, and so there's really no issue with, with that. But um, but I did get the opportunity to play with a lot of parasites, and there was an old professor called John Goldschmidt at University of Tasmania who had retired, but was an amazing parasitologist and really taught me a great deal. And another person, uh, Professor Rick Spear, who's unfortunately passed away now, who also taught me a tremendous amount. So, you know, I had an interest, I was exposed to it, and I was very lucky to have some very generous mentors who, who were kind enough to, to kind of help me um, to learn and to grow in my, in my interest. Oh, awesome. So you would have, I suppose, you would have completed a bachelor degree and then went on to do a PhD. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I did a bachelor's degree in medical laboratory science, which is called medical technology in America. And then I went on to work in hospitals and specialised in microbiology and parasites and other microbes. Um, and then I decided to do a PhD in my spare time because I'm slightly crazy and uh, did that whilst I was working at the hospital. Um, and my intention was to stay in the hospital system. But um, when I finished, I was just lucky that a position came up to teach at the medical school in Tasmania. And so I became an academic and that's how I got really into full-time kind of academia and research. And then, yeah. you know, it went from there. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So another question I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. um, was you've, you've spoken about a few parasites already, but do you yeah. have a favorite one? It's a very difficult question, but I'd, I'd have to pick, you know, one of the things that, took my attention as a child was something called guinea worm. So this is, uh, this is an interesting worm. What happens is you get it from drinking water, which has little water fleas in it. Have you ever seen those little water flea things that skip around in water? And they're really small, but sometimes you'll see them. And in certain parts of the world, particularly tropical regions, these used to be sometimes have larvae or little baby forms of a worm in them called dracunculus or the guinea worm. And when you drank it, they'd get into your gut and they'd pass through the gut wall and then they'd go out into the extremities, generally the feet or the legs, but sometimes even the arms or hand, and they'd grow into these great long worms. You know, they can be sort of this long, like really, really big. And you don't even know they're there. That's the weird part about a lot of parasites. Your body doesn't mount an immune response. You don't feel bad. But eventually the female worm gets gravid, so it becomes pregnant. And uh, then it has to release its babies. And so what they do, they'll come to the surface of the skin release some acid and you'll get a blister and an incredible burning sensation. So the first thing you do when the skin's burning is you go and dump it in the water. And when that happens, that blister will burst and the babies will pass out into the water to find new water fleas to infect. So this used to be found right throughout the tropical regions of the world and there were millions of people infected with it. And the problem is when it pops out, you've got this worm, you've got to sort of wind it on a stick to get it out of your body or you may get an infection. Um, and now with the, the efforts over the past 20 or 30 years of the World Health Organization and the Carter Center, um, we've got that down to about eight cases a year. I think two or three years ago, it was eight cases. There are only four or five countries in the world which still have cases there in Africa. And um, it's it, we are very close to eradicating this disease from the planet. It will be when, which I believe will be successful, when we are successful, this, uh, this will be the second disease ever eradicated from the world um, after smallpox. And, you know, the way we did it is fascinating. We just gave people straws with a little bit of mesh to filter out those water fleas. So when they drank water from fresh water, they could just filter the water and then they didn't drink the water flea and that stopped them getting it. The only challenge we have is it's just been found in dogs recently. You know, in the last couple of years, it used to be only in humans, but we've just seen a few cases appearing in dogs. And we're concerned that it may be jumping species into dogs because it's getting under this pressure. Um, and if that happens, that could cause a problem for our control program. So that is a little bit of a concern that we're starting to see guinea worm in dogs. But it's a fascinating, fascinating parasite. And hopefully, you know, you found that interesting, just the story of guinea worm. Yeah, very interesting. Because usually when you hear about eradication of disease, it's, a, it's about, you know, a, a drug or something. But this is a really simple idea just to isn't stop the transmission, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And we're still, we're still trying to find those last few cases. Obviously now when you do eradication, the closer you get to eradication, the more expensive it gets because you have to really do a lot of surveillance to find the last places where it is and focus on eliminating it there. 
So, so it's just in that final stage, but it's an expensive time to do this work. So there's a lot of money going into it. Um, and particularly from the Carter Centre, Jimmy Carter, uh, the former US president, has been a great advocate for this work over the past 20 or 30 years. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm going to ask you a trickier question um, mm -hmm. based on that story. My so being, <laughs> <laughs> being a parasitologist, how do you feel about getting, almost getting rid of a parasite? I feel a bit sad. Yeah. I know this is a difficult question. Um, I'm, I, um, I, I think it's wonderful for people. You know, this is a horrible disease. Um, it's very psychologically disturbing. It's a bit debilitating. And, you know, we want to be rid of this from the world. And there's no reason we should not be. But, of course, because I'm a parasitologist, I like the worms. And I'm sorry to see it go. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all for it. I think it's a fantastic project. But I will be just a little bit of me will be sad as a parasitologist to see it. <laughs> So is it conflicting, isn't it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks for telling us a little bit about um, yourself and how you got into being a parasitologist. The next set of questions I'm going to ask is um, about our topic of our interview, which is dogs as reservoirs for parasitic zoonoses. So first of all, I'm going to ask you what zoonoses actually means. Um, and then secondly, what types of parasites can we catch from our dogs? Okay, so zoonosis means a parasite that you can catch, or not a parasite, a disease you can catch from an animal. So that's simply what it means, zoonosis, diseases you can get from animals. Um, so a lot of parasitic diseases are zoonoses. There are one or two which you can only get from humans, but the majority, they're, they're actually ones which either you get from animal or animals are part of the life cycle. Um, we've just mentioned guinea worm has been found in dogs now so there's a very very rare parasite that you might get from dogs or which dogs are involved in the life cycle at least you won't get it directly from the dog you'll get it from drinking the water flu but in in africa but you know here at home in australia or wherever people are watching yes we can get parasites from our dogs dogs can carry parasites and it is possible for us to get them and of course you know we love our dogs and our dogs love us more than we love them you know dogs are such wonderful companions and the fact of the matter is it's incredibly safe to have a dog. So I really don't want people to watch this and get worried about their dog or worried that they might get sick because of their dog. That's really not going to happen. And if it did happen, it's probably the owner's fault. <laughs> sort of thing. Because if you take your dog to the vet and you look after your dog's health, like you would look after your own family's health, your dog won't have parasites. It won't get sick and you won't get sick. So just like if you had a child who was sick, you might catch a disease from them. If you have a dog with sick, you might catch a disease from it. So I think the biggest message I would give to people from this whole interview is look after your dogs, take them to the vet, get the advice of a vet, make sure that you regularly deworm them and follow the, the instructions you get given by the vet who really understands these parasitic diseases and how to control them and make sure your dog doesn't get sick with them. Not only will that be good for your dog's health, it's going to be good for your health too. It's, so um, look, Yes, dogs do carry parasites, and there are, there are some several you can get from dogs. It's not that common that people get parasites from dogs, but there are a couple which I've mentioned. One of them um, is hydatid disease, which used to be a big problem in parts of the world, still is in many parts of the world, it was a big problem in Tasmania. We had one of the highest rates of hydatids in the world in Tasmania. Um, and then they had the um, Tasmanian hydatid eradication group was formed, and over the period of about 25 or 30 years from 1965, they went around going to eradicate this. This is a tapeworm that's found in the gut of dogs. But if the eggs infect us, we can get what is the larval stage, the baby stage. And the baby stage doesn't look like a worm. It's a great big kind of cyst that grows in the liver or the lungs. It's really nasty. It can actually be quite serious for people who are infected. And um, the way you're infected is through exposure to dog feces where somehow you get the eggs into your mouth. So maybe you've got dog feces off the ground. You know, these, these eggs can survive in the environment for a long, long, long time. Somehow you've got, you know, in a bit of dirt on your hands as, as some of these eggs and then you've eaten the sandwich and you've ingested it and then you might end up with the problem. Um, the eradication of hydatids from Tasmania was really thorough. And what they did was, they, the biggest thing they did was make sure that farmers stopped feeding their dogs offal. So stopped feeding their dogs liver and gut and things like that, parts of the viscera of sheep and goats. And by doing that, they really almost removed it. Of course, marsupials and things, but that was possible in Tassie because there's not a big wild dog population. There's virtually no wild dogs. 
So whereas the mainland of Australia has dingoes and we can't really manage that population like, we, you know, in Tasmania. So it's not so possible to eradicate hydatids from mainland Australia and there are still cases of it very rarely occurring. Um, very occasionally this tapeworm has been found in farm dogs in Tasmania recently, but the rates are so incredibly low that we, we consider it to be pretty much eradicated from there. And of course the Tasmanian government is still keeping on top of of, of that and making sure that it's, um, that it's not going to come back. Um, so that's one example. That's an interesting one, an important one for humans medically. Another one which is interesting is hookworms. So hookworms, by their name, they're shaped a little bit like a hook, some of them, and um, these infect dogs' guts. And what they do, they get into the gut of the dog and they suck the blood and then you know when they've sucked the blood that's how they get their food and they're happy and then they you know a male hookworm finds a female hookworm and they fall in love and they produce lots of eggs and these eggs are passed out into the environment in your dog's feces and when they get into the environment they then hatch into larvae which crawl around in the ground and these larvae are great because they're actually heat seeking larvae these larvae can detect co2 and heat so they if you're walking barefoot in your backyard and your dog's been defecating, it's been leaving its, its droppings around and you haven't picked them up. And once again, when I say, if you get sick from your dog, it's your fault because <laughs> you haven't looked after your dog. And one of the other things you really need to do is pick up after your dog. If you pick up after your dog and don't leave dog poo lying around, you will not get these diseases. Okay, so take them to the vet, get them treated and pick up their poo. Um, anyhow, but let's say that I'm a bit lazy and, I let my, and my dog, I don't look after it, it gets hookworm. I leave its droppings all over the backyard and these larvae get into the ground. What they'll do is they'll feel my heat because my body has heat and they'll start crawling towards me. So they're microscopic, so I can't see them, but they're crawling towards me. And when they come and hit me, they, they go through the skin. These larvae actually crawl through the skin of your feet. Um, or if you know, I was like putting my hand on the ground, they'd come through my skin of my hand. But mostly we see this in the feet. So they get in there and then they, they, what they want to do in a dog They'll go through the skin, they'll get into the bloodstream, they'll go to the lungs, and then the, you'll cough up the larvae because they're in your lungs. <laughs> you cough them up and then you swallow the cough, goes down into your gut and they become adult worms and then the life cycle begins again. Problem is we're not a dog. So the, the, these little baby worms get confused. They're like, oh, I've got into a, a host, we call it, an animal that, that they're trying to live in, but it's the wrong one. <laughs> this is not a dog, this is a human. So they don't know what to do. So they crawl around under your skin trying to find like a, like what to do and what happens is you'll actually see these little what we call serpentine tracks so you'll see these sort of lines like a serpent's been crawling under your skin and they'll be really red and itchy some people i've actually seen some cases before with people um, including a friend of mine who got a really bad reaction and got blisters even from that some people just get a little red line that's itchy some people get sort of blistery lines just depends on how your immune system reacts to having these little baby worms crawling under your skin and um yeah, it's pretty nasty. This is what we call cutaneous larvae migrans, meaning skin baby worms migrating is what that actual word means. So you've got baby worms migrating under your skin. It'll only last for about four to six weeks. It's quite itchy. It's quite unpleasant. If you do go to the doctor, they can give you some um, worming tablets, which will at least reduce the symptoms. It won't be quite so nasty. Um, the big issue, the only issue you're going to have is bacterial infection if you scratch too much. It's not going to cause a long problem. After six weeks, the baby worms die and you're fine. But you can imagine how disturbing it is. Now, it happens quite slowly. You can't actually see them move. But over a day or two, you'll see this, this serpentine track appearing on your skin. And mainly on the feet is where we see CLM or cutaneous larvae migraines. So that's pretty cool. And... Um, this is hookworms in dogs. You know, in Australia, a national prevalence survey found about 6.7% of dogs in Australia have it. But it gets more common as you go further north because these baby worms don't like the cold. So down in Melbourne or Tasmania, you know, there's some there, not very many. But, you know, they're only really going to be alive in summer because they can't handle the frost. But if you go up north, you know, I did a survey, or one of my students and myself did a survey in Rockhampton when I was working up, up there at CQU, and uh, we found that it was about 25% of the dogs up there had it. So, you know, the further north you get into the tropics, um, some surveys of dingoes and dogs in remote communities in far north Queensland have found that every single dog has this hookworm. Yeah. Now, so that's that one. There is another hookworm in Australia which can infect humans in the gut. It's called Ankylostomus solanicum. It's very, 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 very rare in Australia. And there's only been two human cases found. And um, that was work which I did 
myself and Anson Kohler from Dr. Robin Gass's lab, or Professor Robin Gass's lab from the University of Melbourne, who's a very great parasitologist. We, we got together and did some work and we found two human cases of intestinal infection with this ankylostomus solanicum worm. Now, if you go to the Pacific Islands or to Asia, it's really common there. And we're not totally sure all about it, but there seems to be a zoonotic cycle between dogs and humans, where humans are getting the hookworm and dogs do. And yeah. the person who's the big expert on that is Professor Rebecca Traub from University of Melbourne, who's done wonderful person, done amazing work on this and really a great parasitologist as well. So, you know, you, the thing about parasitology is we don't do it on our own. You know, there are these incredible people out there who do incredible work and we just build on each other's work. And it's, 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 it's a fun, exciting thing to do. So that's another example of, you know, hookworms. They're interesting parasites, um, which you can get from dogs. Um, yeah. And you really don't want baby hookworms crawling under your skin. So the answer is take your dog to the vet, worm it regularly and pick up after it in the backyard and when you're out in the park, okay? And then you'll fix it, you won't have that problem. Your dog is fine, your dog is, loves you. As long as you love it and look after it, you will not have a problem. Um, so the other one which might be worth mentioning is something called Toxicara, which is not that common. Uh, in Australia, it's about 3% of cats and about 1.2% of dogs have it. We did a survey in the tropical region of Australia in, in Rockhampton, and it was about the same, about 1.2%. They're about somewhere around there. Had it. Um, it's more common in puppies. Um, the puppies can actually get it from their mother. So they can actually get this worm both in the mother's milk, and it can even cross the placenta when they're, when they're like fetuses in, growing inside the mum and infect the dog when it's, before it's even born. So that's why it's really common in puppies, this particular um, worm. And this is the same worm that I saw my cat cough up many years ago, if you remember oh, no, earlier on in the interview. So, um, so it can cause problems for us as well, and we might talk about them a bit later. So anyway, yeah, that's some examples. Yeah, some um, great public health messages in there as well about protecting your dog. and um, Look yeah, after your dog and your dog, your, your dog loves you. Make sure you love it, is yeah. what I would say. Look <laughs> after it. Take it to the vet. And I think <laughs> another example of a clever parasite or hookworm loving the tropics like who wouldn't want to live in the tropics especially if you oh, the tropics are wonderful i love living there but yeah but, but you know just clean up after your dog <laughs> and make sure you deworm it and take it to the vet <laughs> <laughs> so you touched on um the last parasite um toxicara which has been a subject of your recent work yeah. and you've actually done some of this work in the u.s is that correct yeah, so recently I, I spent several years working for the CDC in the United States, which is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it's their big public health agency. And I was lucky enough to work at the Parasitology Diagnostic Reference Laboratory there. So we got all the really interesting parasites getting sent to us from around the US and sometimes overseas. Um, so one of the things I got involved with there was in Mississippi, which is the poorest state in the US, so people, people, you know, really don't have a lot of money in Mississippi. It's a subtropical environment, so it's quite hot and humid in the summers. Um, and, you know, as I said, quite a lot of poverty in that particular state. They had three cases over a series of years of people who were, who had um, either went blind or had severe vision loss in one eye. And when the ophthalmologists started looking at their eyes, they saw a worm in there. Oh, wow. And they, they realised this person has a worm living inside their eye. And this is why they've gone blind. It's actually, you know, the, the reaction to having this worm, our immune system goes crazy. It kind of ended up, you know, either they lost their vision or they got very reduced vision as a consequence, which is irreversible. That can't be fixed even once you get rid of the worm. Um, and they identified this was Toxicara. So remember I mentioned Toxicara from dogs? Well, look, normally this goes from dogs and gets into the environment. They, they, in their feces, the eggs are in their feces and those eggs sit in the environment for a while and they then larvate. They get like little baby worms living inside the egg. And those eggs can live for well over a year in the environment. It's quite surprising how long they can live. So long as it doesn't get cold and frosty, they will survive. Um, those generally, now there's two ways you can get this. You can either ingest the egg, right? So just it's in the dust, it's in the environment. If you don't worm your dog, don't clean up after your dog, don't take it to the vet, you might be unlucky. It'll get Toxicara and that will then get put into the environment. Um, the other thing which can happen is like what we call a paratenic host. So this is an animal which gets the parasite, but it doesn't really go through any life stage in it. It just sits there. So like a mouse or something might come along and eat that particular, you know, eat something 
get that. Rabbits are a great one because they like to eat the grass and, you know, there's all these eggs in the dirt. Um, and then the eggs will hatch in that peritoneal host. It will get into their muscles and will just sit there and wait for something to eat it. So then what normally happens, a dog comes and eats the rabbit or the, the mouse, or whatever, it gets Toxicara. Or it can just get it from ingesting the eggs in the environment. Now, the issue is if we as humans ingest those eggs in the environment, or we ingest it in a paratonic host. Chickens can be paratonic hosts as well of Toxicara. Then what happens is the larvae exist from the egg, or if we've eaten it in meat, they're just there. They get into our gut, they pass through the gut wall, and they go into our muscles and organs. Now, normally there's only one or two of these larvae, and it's not. It's, it's amazing how many people have been exposed to this and how many people have had Toxicara in their body. And some of them may even now still have live Toxicara larvae just sitting there somewhere in their, in their organs, not doing anything. Yeah. And it really doesn't make you sick. It doesn't make you sick. That's the weird part. You know, it doesn't cause a problem. So uh, that's fascinating. There are some suggestions that some people may have some symptoms when it's just sitting there, lying doggo, you know, not doing anything. But um, we really haven't proven that at this time. So the vast majority of people are what we call asymptomatic. They don't have symptoms. They're not sick. There's no problem but a very, very small number. And we're talking, you know, several hundred in the US over the last 50 years. So they're not a common thing. The larvae go somewhere they're not meant to. So obviously they're not really meant to be in our organs, but they don't really cause a problem. Um, unless some people, they start crawling through the liver or there's a lot of them start crawling around. And they, this is called visceral larvae migrants. The word viscera meaning like your organs, larvae, baby worms, migraines, migrating. So they start crawling through and that can cause some severe problems. They get abdominal pain. There's a particular white cell in their blood that goes crazy because it's trying to fight off these parasites. We see lots of these eosinophils, these, these particular white cells that are there to kill parasites. They, they start getting really high rates of them as their body tries to fight it. And look, in very rare cases, they can have severe disease and it can be quite debilitating. Another thing it can do is it gets a bit lost and it goes up into the brain. Now you can imagine how bad it is to have larvae crawling through your brain. We call that neural larvae migraines, so brain, baby worms migrating. And if you have a heavy infection of Toxicara, those very rare cases, and I need to point out this is exceptionally rare, it doesn't happen often, that they get lots of larvae migrating through their brain, they can have severe problems. So they can have sudden onset of epilepsy, meningoencephalitis, which is where they have an inflammation of their brain that can potentially be fatal. So people can die from it. It's really quite severe. Um, and the third thing which we, we often associate with this, though once again, extremely rare, probably only, as I said earlier, about 500 cases in the US um, in, in the last 50 years, is this ocular larvae migraines where they migrate into the eye and you've got a little baby worm inside your eye and your immune system reacts to that. And it's actually the reaction of the immune system which causes all the damage to your vision. And we had three cases of that in the space of two or three years in Mississippi, which is unusual. So um, various researchers at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, um, led by uh, Associate Professor Charlotte Hobbs, who's a pediatric infectious diseases physician there and, and researcher, um, decided to investigate this and they contacted us at the CDC and said, look, can you help us with some of the diagnostics and help us with some of the planning of this? And so um, Sue Montgomery was an epidemiologist there who was very involved. And I want to shout out as well to um, Sukwan Handali and Gretchen Cooley, who did a lot of the diagnostic work. Um, and also uh, Meredith Lane, who did a lot of the PCRs for other parasites. So, so this was a team effort, like all these things. We don't do it on our own. It's a great big team of people. And that's how, that's how science works. And uh, we, we went through and did a survey to see just how common is this. And, you know, when we looked at people in Mississippi, up to 9% of them had antibodies suggesting they'd been exposed to this parasite. Now, we know nationally in the United States, it's 5% of people have been exposed, but it's almost double in Mississippi. And there are lots of reasons for that. Like it's a tropical, subtropical environment. There's um, issues with, you know, people, people are, have a lot of poverty. They may not be able to afford to get their dogs to the vet like they'd like to, et cetera. So there's a lot of reasons why this would happen, but it's an interesting finding and something which we will be following up on probably. Um, so that... That was an interesting uh, thing. Now, we, we don't know a lot about Toxicara in Australia and how common it is. 
we haven't done any major surveys of, uh, of prevalence uh, in humans here. But we do know it's here and we know that it's found in, in a certain number of dogs, about 1% of dogs, and cats get it too. About 3% of cats have it. So, you know, the kind of things we want to worry about here is, for instance, children playing in sand pits where cats have been defecating. You know, um, the big answer again is clean up after your animals, you know, <laughs> clean up after your animals. Um, make sure that you take your animal to the vet, you get it wormed and you clean up after its mess. Um, and then nobody will have a problem. Oh, wow. Such fascinating research. Um, and I like how you are really pointing out how um, as scientists, we always work together and we have this collaborative nature about Absolutely. adding yeah. facts things that we find out and we add them together and integrate them. Yeah, no, that's right. You know, any, any work or most work done in science today, there's a big team involved and we can't know everything. You know, there's areas which I'm good at and areas which other people are good at. So we have to work together as a team and come together to answer these big questions. So I might just ask you one more question on Toxicara, which is how, how old is Toxicara? Like, has it been around forever? Yeah, Toxicara, we don't know exactly how old it is, but the earliest evidence of Toxicara was 1.2 million year old extinct hyena. So in northwest Pakistan, they, uh, they did some archaeology and they found this hyena, you know, this sort of ancient hyena that was 1.2 million years old. And they had a look at the coprolite, which is the term for like the the, the feces of this dead hyena, right? So it's been dead for 1.2 million years, it's fossilised, it's got fossilized feces in its gut. And they had a look at that and they found eggs of Toxicara. Wow. So, so we know this thing's been infecting dogs for at least 1.2 million years. And of course, dogs have been a part of human interaction for tens of thousands of years at least. And, and you know, we, we work closely with them. So probably humans have occasionally got Toxicara infections from their dogs for many, many millennia. Yeah, and I can't remember what you said, but so, with dogs that have Toxicara, do they suffer much from an infection? Well, puppies can get, uh, it depends on how heavy their infection is. So if you have a mild infection, it probably won't be too much of an issue. But yeah. what you'll find, puppies who have very heavy infections, they'll often get very swollen bellies. They may have nutrient deficiencies, so they won't grow properly. You know, they'll, they'll be stunted in their growth. And... Um, you know, really severe cases, sometimes it can even block the gut. Just that massive, they're quite big worms, and this, the mass of them can just block the gut, and then the puppy could die because it can't go to the toilet because yeah. all, of it, all of its intestines are blocked by worms. So, yeah, they're really important to, um, to be aware of that. And, you know, once again, take-home message I just want to hand home to everyone is your dog loves you and you need to love your dog. So <laughs> when you get a puppy, you need to take it to the vet. You need to get the vet to look at it, give it the worm, worming tablets it needs, give it all the vaccines it needs and look after it so yeah. that it stays healthy and you stay healthy. Oh, that's a great message. Especially, um, you know, I grew up on a farm, so we had our dog stayed outside, but now I'm um, living in Melbourne. I have a dog that sleeps on my bed. So yeah, and so you want to make sure your dog's well. Yeah. <laughs> And after this interview, I'll be making sure that I'm up to date with my worming. Absolutely. Worming program, <laughs> for sure. Um, so I'm just going to ask you one more question because you've told us lots about different parasites and very fascinating stories. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask was if there was um, some people that were watching this interview that, you know, found your stories very fascinating and I'm sure that a lot of, a lot of, of our audience will, what advice would you give to people um, that might want to start studying science in this um, day and age? Okay, so the first thing is it's, it's a great area to get into. I mean, it's so exciting. I'm so um, grateful to have a job where I can do things that I enjoy. You know, I, I, I've always enjoyed gross things, as we said, since I was a kid, but I've also always enjoyed just the detective part of being a scientist that you have a problem and you have to try and find the answer and you get to work with teams of really really brilliant people to try and find the answer to these difficult questions um, the first thing I'd say is look go and do your undergraduate degree work hard make sure that you study thoroughly and then you know there are many opportunities if, if you don't want to go on and do a PhD to still do really interesting work so for instance the first 12 years of my career I was in hospital laboratories there's veterinary laboratories. There's many, many other areas which you can work in in science. It's so wide and so varied. Um, if you want to get into 
like long-term research, a PhD is a great opportunity for that. So have a look at doing a doctorate, have a talk to um, academics at your local university about what opportunities there might be. Have a think about what you enjoy. What do you think is really interesting? I mean, and then have a look at who seems to be a good person to supervise you to do that PhD. Um, find out who's the expert. Find out who does the kind of stuff that you think is cool and approach them and say, look, I'd like to do a PhD. Could you, could you supervise me? And, um, you know, the good thing about a PhD is it's hard work. It's demanding anything worthwhile is, but it's incredibly rewarding. You'll learn so much. You'll enjoy it. You'll, you'll become an expert on an area and you'll make a massive difference by, by answering really important questions. So there's all sorts of opportunities out there. Um, if you want to get in touch with people in parasitology, for instance, uh, things like the Australian Society for Parasitology might be a good place to start. Contact them or have a look at your local university and ask them if there's anyone who does parasitology there who you could maybe you know, get to know and uh, see if you want to consider working with them in the long term. But there's wonderful opportunities out there, both with just a bachelor's degree and if you want to go on to do master's and PhD. And I'd really encourage people if they want to do it, do it. It's, it's exciting. And it's rewarding. And I hope some of them have found some of these stories interesting because it is interesting. And I get to do something where every day I enjoy going to work. So Richard, someone listening to this now um, and found that your story is really interesting, would they be able to approach you to do a PhD? Absolutely. I'm, I'm always looking for PhD students. So please do contact me. My email's r.bradbury at federation.edu.au. Oh, great. And so I'd obviously love to chat more with you about parasites, um, but we are running out of time. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you for doing this interview with us. And thank you. Um, yeah, have a great day. Thanks very much for inviting me to talk. And um, thank you. I'll see you later. Bye. Cheers. Bye.